Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the FIDE Candidates 2022 edition. There are eight players. They play 14 rounds, and the winner will play against Magnus Carlsen in the World Championship match. Or Magnus will not do that, and first and second place will play against each other. But we have yet to figure all that out. <clears throat> After eight rounds of action, Yanni Pomnishi leads the field, and Fabiano Caruana is close by. And that sends us to a marquee matchup in round number nine. And also... Uh, a few other very interesting matchups, which uh, will potentially determine if Fabiano defeats Jan, then the tournament's wide open, okay? So the first game that we are, in fact, going to cover is the game between Caruana and Jan Jepomnici because it did not disappoint. It began with E4, E5, Knight F3, Knight F6. Now, this was already a little bit surprising. Not the move Knight F6, but the move E4 on move 1. Why? Well... You know that Jan is going to play the Petrov. Maybe you didn't know that because you just don't really follow the chess world too closely. You just watch Gotham videos because I'm a, a comfort for you. Perhaps you watch me with a meal uh, or you watch, uh, you know, in, in your spare time during the day to just keep up in general and, and listen to my voice. I don't know. Maybe I just called you out. Hi. Uh, but yeah, Jan plays the Petrov defense. He even played in the World Championship match. But Fabiano also plays the Petrov defense when he plays with the black pieces. So... You know, it's one of these things. It's like two of the world's leading practitioners of the opening. So instead of just, you know, playing D4, some sideline, not C5, but C4, uh, that, you know, Fabiano decides I'm going to test Jan's opening knowledge. We have seen this position already. Uh, Jan played this against Hikaru. Jan played this against Report. Castles, Castles, C4, C, uh, C6. And here Report went for this crazy Queen B3 line, which after this, there was like a Queen B7 at some point, then... Uh, but we, we have rookie one, and Jan plays bishop f5. So in this position, uh, Fabiano plays the second most popular move, which is queen out to b3. Now there is a major difference between the way Report played this and the way Fabi played this. The rook is already here, targeting the knight, and the b7 pawn is hanging. We have queen d7. And now, Fabiano Caruana plays a novelty at the highest level. He plays a move that nobody's ever played before, and that move is knight to h4. This is a very interesting move. Uh... When I say novelty at top level, a little bit of a fun fact, this has been played one time in the database by somebody named Mitya Rosman. Yes, Rosman, like me. Turns out apparently I have a relative in Slovenia. Actually, there's a lot of Rosmans who live in Slovenia, if I'm not mistaken. Slovakia? Slovenia? Uh-oh. I don't remember. And I don't want to insult anybody. Don't be insulted. I don't remember, honestly. But there's a lot of Rosmans there. So, um, but yeah, this move has been played. That person was rated 1700 and they ended up losing. Uh, but the point is that, you know, you, you, you make black go away. And now white slides back and uh, defends the pawn and targets the knight. Nepo plays knight a6, immediately trying to fork where the queen and bishop stand. Fabiano naturally plays the move a3, stopping that. And now Jan plays f5. By this point... Excuse me. By this point, Jan is down about 30 minutes on the clock, which we don't really see. We have takes takes, knight to c3, rook c8 pinning the knight to the queen, and now Fabiano plays the move f3. So, so far, everything has been Fabiano's preparation. He hasn't even thought. In this position, black should not rush with the capture on c3, because structurally speaking, white is doing very well. This knight can always reroute to the f4 square, and the dark squared weaknesses of black will be very weak after, let's say, a plan like this. You'll notice I'm obviously just making moves for black that are not very good, but this is the idea. And this knight is out of the game, not to mention the fact that if white ever wants, white can just break black structure here and play this knight versus bishop position, and white just has a beautiful position. The dark squares are like a million, you know, million bucks. Uh, and that's sort of the long-term idea. Jan here thinks for a long time and finds the best move. So Jan is refuting the preparation over the board by playing all the best moves. So here he plays uh, bishop to e7, targeting the knight on h4. Fabiano defends it. The point is that taking this looks really good for black, but actually white is totally fine and still has the dominant dark square control. So instead of that, Jan goes here. Fabiano now takes his first think. 17 moves of preparation played by Fabiano. He has two ideas here. He can go queen a4, trying to trade queens, or he can go queen to e2. The point of this move is that now the bishops stand like, uh, like a kebab. You know, I'm just going to eat the pepper, then I'm going to eat the lamb, then I'm going to eat the, uh, you know, the pepper, the lamb, the pepper, the lamb. So, yeah, I mean, that's the idea. Uh, and so Jan plays bishop f6 going for this, uh, and we have a big trade. We have queen d7, 
I take the pawn, you take the pawn, I move my king. Fabiano here also had the opportunity to play bishop to e3. You cannot take the pawn, I mean, you can take the pawn on b2, uh, but then I'm forking you and I'm actually much faster with the material that I will be capturing. So, this is the position after 21 moves. Fabi has built up about a 45 minute time advantage, but now he starts to think a lot. And here, I was doing commentary briefly earlier today with uh, Sagar Shah from Chess Base India. Shout out to him. Uh, and this grandmaster we found somewhere on the internet, uh, Anish uh, uh, Giri, so I don't know. Don't really remember his name. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Obviously, the great, the wonderful, the talented Anish Giri. And here we discovered that white has one way to push the initiative. Stockfish gives this position plus 1.2. And the point is that you go here, and then you have to give this check anyway. The point is that black is forced to play king f7, as black counterattacks the bishop on d3 with our attack over here. It's insane. Tactical complications, if bishop d6, knight d3, both sets of rooks. Everybody's staring at everybody. It's like a, like a standoff, you know, in a movie. But after this, you still cannot take, but you can play bishop f1, an incredible move. And there are head-spinning complications now. For example, rook e7, bishop d6, Rook takes e1, rook takes e1, rook to d8. Now in this position, white can play rook d1 with the idea of bishop takes, right? Getting this bishop out of the way. Um, black can play knight to e6, but now we grab the pawn. So bishop f1 is like the entire idea. And the variation that Anish had shown us was there are various moves like knight c8, by the way, like defensive moves, but then this would be lost. Um, there is bishop c4 potentially, and then you can sacrifice a rook, uh, and there's just a completely insane line here where black could accidentally get mated. That's mate. That is mate. The king is completely mated in the center of the board. Um, Fabi spent a, like a ton of time here, 30 minutes, and he ended up going for bishop takes f5, which was another one of the moves. He also maybe could have tried to route the uh, root the bishop around this way. Route, root, route. But you know what Fabi said after the game? He said he didn't even consider bishop f1, which is, which is actually fascinating because Anish found this move during the broadcast and said, this is a move that Fabiano would find, just like retreating the bishop out of the way and it will always slingshot back when necessary, right? Um, and I mean, it was just an incredibly complicated position, but what happened in the game is that all the pieces got traded and Jan finds this beautiful well-timed move hitting everything and now if you play rook e7 check king f6, you have some issues. Pieces are sort of stuck guarding one another. You cannot go here because you hang the bishop. Black is okay. Okay. Instead of that, we have rook e4. <clears throat> Jan grabs this and this. And suddenly for a very brief moment, after something like rook a8, bishop back to d4, bishop f8 and rook e2, uh, Jan can just go for b5. Like Jan can actually just totally flip the script and try to play this end game for a win. He has a pass B-pawn. That is called what we call an outside pass pawn. I mean, nope, there's nobody there. Like, White's got to find a way to defend it. I don't know what's going to happen. But Jan doesn't go for that uh, and instead just simplifies and forces a draw. Kind of like what he did against Hikaru when he had an unpleasant position for a bit. And when he flipped the script, uh, he just changed the, the game uh, into a quick draw. So a huge game. Th th this is a massive game for the standings because Karawana gets his chance and misses this opportunity, Bishop F1. It was really his only moment of the game. Uh, and I mean, credit to Jan, who was out prepared, down 40 minutes, and just played a great defensive game, putting the task to Fabi to find some you know, unbelievable resources. And he maintains his, uh, his one point lead. Um, the next game that I would like to show you uh, is, uh, is this one uh, between Dingli Ren and Jan Krzysztof Duda. Uh, this was a very long game. It was a Neo-Catalan, so knight f3, and you'll notice that black does not play bishop e7 castles, allowing d4. Black grabs on c4 straight away, and then has to, you know, give the pawn back, and try to fight back on the queen side with b5, c5, and the like. And by about move 10 or 15, um, this is uh, just an extremely unpleasant position uh, if, if, you're, if you're playing with black. Uh, I mean, extremely unpleasant is like a stretch, but white is just... Always, always better here. It's just always, just always, always better. You know, white is going to play rook d1, rook c1, try to maybe get some space. You know, this knight will move out of the way. And, and that's and that's what Dingli Ren does. I mean, you know, he, he centralizes his rook. He brings the second one. 
now he has a 19, piece, 19 points of material barreling down the d-file, is due to cut fine completely. I mean, absolutely. Um, queen f4, and Ding creates imbalance by taking with his g-pawn. So that's the first step of imbalance. Maybe he will play e3 at some moment. Uh, we have another exchange. Uh, and Ding plays knight e5. So like I've said already several times, uh, you know, white is just going to try to make a couple of exchanges and control the center file and go for those weaknesses. Black can be quick with counterplay of rook c2, but something like this can happen. And again, white is just faster. Like, that's the thing about all these Catalan positions is that, like, by the time black is ready, white is already there. White just always seems permanently a step ahead. Uh, and, you know, it's up to Duda. Duda's a very good defender. He's a fighter, you know, but here's Ding, and Ding, Ding begins... Uh, applying the pressure. He's protecting his king with his bishop. He now pins the bishop to the rook. We have a trade, and here he goes. Rook c4, everything is stabilized. We're just gonna, you know, we're gonna slowly but surely go over there, and maybe while you're stuck defending, I'm gonna sneak in and grab something on f7. And, you know, like I just said, look at look at this tactic by Ding. BA5, back rank mate. Duda saw that. Duda saw that. Get, getting a little uh, counterplay of his own here with rook c2. White is a little bit paralyzed. Kind of tough to move. Knight e4 is coming. B4. Uh, and rook c1, all, I mean, like, very reasonable moves. Here, Duda could have taken, but you'll notice that Ding has slowly worked his magic, and he has what we call a queenside majority. He has the 2-on-1 on, on that side of the board, and that's how Ding is going to try to win this game. Like, I called that all the way back on move 10. I said it was an extremely unpleasant position to be playing uh, with black, and, and, and this is really the reason. Like, in all of these long-term games in the Catalan, white just always seems to be asking black questions. And if black doesn't have an answer at some point, black just loses. Like there's, there's no there's no counterplay whatsoever. The pawn structure is the same. It's all the same pawns. And it's, you know, if black answers all the questions, black makes a draw. If black doesn't answer all the questions, then black will suffer forever. And in this game, Ding, uh, well, I mean, it, it's still equal. It's zero, 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 even though Ding is down, Ding is up two pawns. It's actually the, mo okay, one pawn. Because, because he has this, he has that pawn and, that pawn is going to walk, right? So black has to play defense, and apparently he had to play knight h5 here. This was the idea that he had to go for. Knight takes f4. Instead of that, he plays rook b3 first. And now, unfortunately, rook c1 poses another question. And if you go here and then try to play for knight h5, knight c4 comes and you're too slow. By the time you come here, I'm running. Knight h5 had to be played in that particular situation Duda misses it, and by the time the players make it to the 40th move, <clears throat> there's this. And I told you folks a long time ago, if nobody deals with the A-pawn in time, black is going to be in serious trouble because this pawn will fall. Ding got his knight to e5 on move 21, okay? And it has stood there. It has stood there. It made a couple of moves. Yes, it went over here, it took a pawn, but that is the money-making square. The e5 square, when it gets back there, no one's... We left the king. We left the king and a horse together in the castle. And they are going to get absolutely obliterated. And here comes rook f7. And when that a-pawn survives, this is just a losing endgame for Duda. Duda had to answer questions until move 36. On move 36, he had to find knight h5 with the idea of getting to this king with knight takes f4. And even then, it's still a game to be played. But he misses it. He misses this idea. And now, after the time control... Basically, this endgame is all about Ding will trade off the pieces. The A-pawn will stand here, defended by the rook. The bishop and the rook for the enemy have to constantly monitor it. And the worst nightmare about this endgame as well is the fact that the king is cut off. So black's king is completely paralyzed along the back rank and cannot stand up to anybody. For example, h4, the king cannot just begin walking over because you lose h7. And I mean, you could say, well, well, that's really easy. I'll, you know, I'll just play h6. Yeah, but then you weaken this pawn. You're going to lose all the pawns. And that's what Ding does. Ding very slowly just walk. Look at this. Look at this. Look. I mean, he's just, that's it. There's nothing to be done. The bishop covers the king from walking to e8, by the way. That's another very nice idea. The king tried to get that way. He would get, you know, smashed. And once you remove uh, black's defenses, the king will now walk up to the pawn and on move 61, Duda resigned because th that's it. I mean, the king is coming to help, and that's it. Well, once the king comes to help, bishop c6, you shield everybody and you promote. Yeah, uh, Young Krzysztof Duda is now on a losing streak, and Ding Li Ren has won his first game of the candidates, and actually uh, slides into third place tie out of last place. 
he, he was for a couple of rounds, second to last. This is the thing about the candidates. You win one game, suddenly everything changes. So Ding is back. And if he wins one more game, I mean, hello. All right, hello. The next game that I have for you is the game between uh, Richie Report with the black pieces and Ali Reza Firuja. Firuja struggling, he's looking for a win. Uh, Report today did not show up in the pink suit. Uh, we have a Berlin invitation, and Firuja says, I much prefer Madrid. Let's stay in anti-Berlin territory. We have bishop c5 and castles and knight d4. We've seen this already a handful of times in this event. We've seen knight bd2. We've seen bishop g5. Uh, you're going to see the game Rajab of uh, Hikaru up next, where he, uh, Rajab of played c3. Castles is one of the other fourth main lines. Black plays knight to d4. We have this, this. Now c3, bishop back to b6. And Hikaru himself has played this with black several times. Knight a3 is looking to go over here. We have c6, d6. And in this position, black's general plans are like h6, preventing bishop g5, sliding the bishop back preemptively to c7. a5 is a common move to get something like this. But Report plays a move. I don't know if he was inspired over the board. I think he was inspired over the board. He decided to play queen e7, which is... A weird, flexible, non-committal move, maybe preparing d5, maybe preparing bishop to g4 and long castle. It's been played only once ever. It was played in the game Karyak and Vidit World Blitz Championship in, I think, Riyadh in 2019. Uh, and uh, yeah, well, that's exactly what happens. Bishop to g4, queen slides out of the way. And you'll notice that white doesn't have an f3 knight, which normally white has. So since white doesn't have that, white wants to go here. That pawn break will generate a big attack. So you want to get out of this and play king h1. All of that happens. And here's f4 and here's a4. And all pandemonium breaks loose. Uh, Firuja has taken off his sports coat. He unbuttoned some of his shirt. He rolled up his sleeves. Report is fighting shirtless. They're calling the Madrid police. And I mean, both guys have stood up and they're just, bah! You know, you know Firuja ducks under. You know, he gets the, uh, he gets the takedown. They're up against the, uh, the wall over there. Everyone's in pain. I mean, these dudes are just brawling in the middle of the playing hall. All right? Uh, we have Bishop back to C2. B5. I mean, Report coming again over the top, trying to elbow Firuja. He plays F takes E5. You know, both guys landing at the same time. D E5, sacking the knight in the center of the board, getting his bishop back. And Report sacks the bishop into the center. All right, everybody breathe. What is going on? Firuja's down one pawn. Rapport is uncastled both ways. Now, if you breathe for a second, Rapport gets to castle, he's fine. So what are you going to do? Don't let a guy castle, right? So here you can play bishop d2. This does prevent castling in a unique way because bishop c3 is just so strong here. Um, but Firuja decides to be more forceful with bishop e3 straight away, giving up yet another pawn. Uh, at this point, he plays queen f2. Uh, with ideas over here and this prevents castling in a very fascinating way if castles were to happen right now Then the move bishop d4 would arrive the queen guards both bishops and after something like queen before uh, Not bishop c5 forking, but actually opening the king and the king is wide open Peace would be lost h5 h3 and that's it. You can even probably take this is not enough to defend the king so Report backs up. He's like all right I want to play knight g4. And in this position, after several attacks on the queen, you'll notice that black will never castle. And I anticipate that this is a terrifying position to play for black because your king is stuck in the middle of the board and white is just trying to give you all the pawns. All of them. We have rook c1 with various nasty discoveries on the queen, like bishop b3, bishop a4, right? Uh, Report actually here plays the best move. Rook d8 is top engine move, trying to trade the queen. For example, bishop a4, queen d2. The move that um, that was suggested here by Anish during the broadcast was knight g4. And then setting up a defensive blockade with something like queen e5 and maybe f6. The idea f6 to get the queen out of the way somehow and then put the king on f7. So, you know, like queen e5 prevents uh, the white queen from moving. Maybe something like rook cd1, but it's still not a pleasant situation, you know? I mean, f6, king f7 is great, but white is always harassing black. Report plays rook d8, however, and then here brings his queen back, queen h4, and, you know, computer here wants really obscure moves like h6, 
it's not really clear what either side uh, can accomplish. But if anybody is playing for anything, it's white because black is stuck in the center. All right? And black can't just walk the king to c8. That's not how this works. All right? By the time you get over here, I'm like, hi. Okay, so you can't do that. Your king's just stuck in the center. It's a very unpleasant position. Rook f5, queen b2. Ali Reza here finds this incredible move. Rook g1, undeveloping his rook from anything. It cannot be touched anymore. And the idea is queen g3. And who guards your pawns? Who guards your pawns? I'm sacking the rook. You can't take it. Because I'm opening up to the king. I just told you. Queen c7, queen e7, rook e1, kiss of death. Queen g3, incredible move. And Ali Reza just has to beat the clock. The black king suffocating. <gasps> Gasping for air. Rook f1, h5. Report trying to lash out. e5 cuts the coordination here to g7. Let's trade queens. Do you trade queens here? Are you insane? No. H4, H3, you can't get any closer. Bishop to E4, hello. You should have dealt with your king because your king and rook are not getting involved. Queen H6, do you trade queens here? No. And by the time you get a chance to get your king to safety, I've not only grabbed a pawn back, I'm gonna grab a second pawn back. I'm no longer down two pawns, I'm down no pawns. And you have all the problems of your position that you had. Queen H5, you want a queen trade? Come on, third time's the charm, no. Knight e5, bishop 2e2, queen slides out of danger, but unfortunately the knight does not. You cannot take because you're pinned, and report resigned on move 41. Ali Reza's first win of the candidates! It's a long time coming, but congratulations to Ali Reza on the big win. Uh, report has been going up and down and up, and I mean, he, he comes to fight, honestly. He, he looks to make games super exciting. Uh, and, a, and a very one, a very exciting one uh, the, 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 this was for sure. So big win for Firuja. And the final game of the round that I have for you is Hikaru, uh, is Rajaba versus Hikaru Nakamura. And, uh, you know, um, this, we want Hikaru to win this game because we also wanted Fabi to beat Jan. So we wanted the whole tournament to be super close. And now that we have Ding arriving and maybe he'll win one more, you never know what's going to happen. So this one I just mentioned was an anti-Berlin, Bishop C5. Not bishop g5, not knight d2, not castles, but c3 preventing the move knight to d4. We have both sides castling, and here black can play in a handful of ways. Uh, passively with d6, but Hikaru really likes these, uh, I think, positions with d5 uh, and attacking the center right away. It's a very concrete line. You have to know what you're doing. You trade in the middle, and then you play a5. We've seen this. I mean, we see this all the time now. Both the bishop and the knight can now use the a7 square. Uh, you'll notice that white doesn't do this because bishop a6, and this would just be very pleasant for black. So queen c2, queen e7, and Hikaru here can develop his position in a few ways, like maybe uh, rook to d8, or maybe h6, or even undeveloping for a second to play like c6, or maybe knight d7 after moving the bishop. But Hikaru threatens Rajabov with a repetition. Which is funny, because, you know, like bishop d3, knight c6, and I, during the broadcast I was like, is that actually going to happen? But Rajabov goes to e2. But Hikaru does come back. You know, Rajabov does have the, the option here. Like, if he really wants... I don't know what would have happened here. Uh, but Rajabov does this. And the thing is that, you know, if black's going to retreat the bishop to b6 and bishop b5 happens again, then at least you have knight a7. But Hikaru puts the bishop on a7, and now the bishop goes back to b5, and the black knight cannot go to a7. So it's like... Oops, right? It's a little bit of an oopsie here, because you you should have, like, right? To but And it's not so simple. Like, you can just say, oh, well, bishop d7, I don't understand. What, what do you not understand? White develops very quickly, and if black is not careful, like, black just straight up will lose a pawn on a5. So, for example, take, take, knight a5. I mean, you try, I mean, th there, there's various bishop f2s in this game, as you're going to see, but that's the idea, right? So, bishop b5... Hikaru thinks for like 20 minutes here and just says, you know what? You can take my pawn. I'm going to damage your structure. You can take my pawn for free, for nothing, zero. He could, if he wanted to, play bishop f2. I don't know why he didn't. I imagine it's that like, this is, I mean, this is a, a miserable position. White will play b4, white will play a5. Now the black rook just is stuck. The rook is on, is on jail watch over there, making sure the pawn doesn't walk up the board. 
Black doesn't have an attack here. This is not happening. The bishop can take it. The king is also not even in danger. King is vibing on h1, like do your worst, right? So Hikaru was like, ah, and, and, and I'm sure, you know, a lot of things are working against him. He's like, man, my options are just go for broke, just go crazy or suffer in the end game. So what does he do? He doesn't take on f2 and Rajabov just plays b4. The knight is now no longer going to get hit with discoveries and Hikaru's just going for it. I mean, he's just playing f5. Now, engines hate when humans play like this because the engine's like, I'm up a pawn and you have no attack. Also, you're trash. Also L, also ratio, also you fell off. Also make better content. Like Stockfish is a Twitter troll, just like scumbag human who posts 90% of the time against like, uh, you know, Premier League football stuff. And 10% of the time just writes like all sorts of like nasty comments to people. I mean, that is what Stockfish is. Stockfish is like, F5, are you nuts? There's nothing here. Okay. And... Black actually visually gets a few decent moves. You know, this is defended, and if Black can go rook f8 and g5 and knight f4, and but here's the thing: I mean, Rajabov, he might be having a rough event, but you know, he, he's a he's a good player, and you know, which is bishop b3. And the problem is that Black can offer trades of you know queen or knight, but if you take on e3 here, now I don't even have bad pawns, and I'm covering f4 completely. And by the time you play rook f8 to attack this. I mean, I can play rook f1, right? At the very least, I can play rook f1. I can bring my knight back and push my a pawn. So Hikaru offers a queen trade, trying to improve his structure. Rajabov says no. Hikaru wins a pawn back, and rook e2 happens. But at this point, you know, counterplay is being created for sure. c5, for example, knight c6, takes, takes, rook back to f6, b5. But the a pawn, right? I mean, at the end of the day, it's the a pawn. And the A pawn just walks. There's, I mean, it's the same thing as the, ding, the Dingley Ren game, right? The pawn gets to a six and to a seven, and uh, White just has to make slow and steady progress. And I'm going to continue to click the forward button. Hikaru plays c5, kind of lashing out to sacrifice a little bit, but there's no blockade here. I mean, Rajabov just defends everything, pushes everything through, and on move 41, Hikaru resigns. And, um, yeah, I mean, this is, the, you know, this is a brutal loss. First of all, it's Rajabo's first classical win in 37 games in three years. So he, um, he gets a huge win and now kind of gets that monkey off his back. And uh, hopefully he can string together a couple of good results as well. Today's game by Hikaru was definitely weird because he had eight rounds of really good prep and really good and solid play. Strong calculation, you know, smart risk taking. Some some went wrong today. I I don't know what it is because I don't I, I'm not a candidate level player I don't know. I know what goes wrong at my level. All right. I'm trash compared to this level So I don't know and Hikaru obviously uh, will, will, will let us know But it I don't know it seemed it seemed like he just he really wanted to win and I I don't know I guess he just went about it the wrong way because we wanted him all to win too. I mean, the dream scenario today was Fabi wins, Hikaru wins. And suddenly there's three people with half a point separating them, right? And Hikaru won versus Rajabov earlier. So he decided to like, I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, you know, if I'm going to cheer for somebody in the event, it's going to be Hikaru. Um, so after nine rounds of action, Yana's still a point ahead of everybody. Six and a half. Then it's Fabi with five and a half. There's a links in the comments uh, in the description. But Hikaru and Ding are still tied for third with four and a half points out of nine. Uh, and it just got real close. We got a bunch of guys with four, Duda with three. Um, and we'll see what happens. Five more rounds to go in the candidates. Uh, we'll see you all for round number 10. Get out of here.